thank you all again for joining us and kicking off the year. Uh, we're really, really excited for all the work we've put in to you know, both get our, our vision for this year together, but more importantly, bringing on some amazing collaborators who are, are here to share their expertise and, and you know, get you guys, more importantly, informed and, and have access to just some incredible knowledge on what's out there and how to really get into the really important uh, applications of uh, the marine space. And so with that today, first off, we have Marcus Erickson with us today from Five Gyres and Lindsay Wanker from Adventure Scientists. We're thrilled to have you guys both and we'll jump right in in just a minute. I'm going to just start with a quick presentation on who we are and, uh, and then we'll get right to it. So real quick. Um, so first off again, welcome to our first event of the year. Uh, so this is just a little quick intro into into what we have going on for the year. There we go. So uh, I'm not going to go over the full problem statement, but you guys have seen some from the past or from the literature we have on our site. You know, there's an overall, oh, of course, technology. There's an overall systemic lack of opportunity really to facilitate solutions for the ocean space that we've really experienced both in my own career and as we've looked across the broader oceanscape. And so we really view the opportunity to create regenerative and not just sustainable solutions as something that we're really passionate about and we bring together other collaborators who share this vision with us. And out of anywhere, South Florida really is the place that we see this opportunity to create. And so our mission is to empower a community of current aspiring entrepreneurs to innovate for this regenerative impact. And we really lean on our values and people who align with our values to really join us in this effort. And so as of this year, we're now really focusing on rolling out our venture studio, which we'll dive into in a moment here, that co-creates and crowdsources startups to develop these collective ocean innovation pipelines that we can deploy at scale while partnering with local incubators and accelerators to help tailor their programs to serve these pipelines. And we do this as this hybrid 501c3 and LLC. And a venture studio brings together a team of co-founders as well as strategic direction and the capital to help create these startups and really help get these tangible solutions going. And we're really the first ocean impact venture studio in the continental US trying to really build this from the ground up. And as I've mentioned, we really lean on our collaborator network, which we're really thrilled to have Adventure Scientists and Five Gyres a part of now, where we get to leverage their expertise and knowledge to really empower you guys to be able to get into these different applications of the space and try to innovate to really make change for our oceans. And we do that by having programs like this, where we bring everyone together and really get people you know, educated and inspired on how to get into the space and do something about it. And also at the same time, bring in stakeholders for sponsoring and partnering with us to support our startups and philanthropically enable a lot of our programming. And so that brings us to what I wanted to dive into today, which is our opportunities for sea change. At the end, we'll, we'll have this back up just to kind of refresh you guys. But these are the six areas that we've really identified that are major opportunities for impact that we want to help co-create startups with all of you. And so today we're going to be diving into the plastics and pollution, plastic and pollution detection area. And we're really excited to have five gyres and adventure scientists with us to explore more. So with that, uh, you know, I just wanted to kind of have it all tie in for you guys. Uh, really, really excited to have Marcus and Lindsay with us. Uh, Marcus, you want to start up, start us off, give you a little, give a little intro into your background and, and your history with Five Gyres. Sure, sure. I'm a, I'm the co-founder of the Five Gyres Institute. Uh, my, my wife Anna Cummins, she and I began the organization about ten years ago. What we saw ten years ago was a lot of big questions. Well, first of all, a lot of attention on the ocean plastic issue. It was just blowing up worldwide. But a lot of big questions. People were saying, okay, where is this garbage, this fictional island of trash, this garbage patch? And how much is in the ocean? How much trash? Where is it? What's the impact? So we began the Five Gyres Institute to go explore each of the five subtropical gyres, North Pacific being just one, and uh, answer some basic research questions, so launching expeditions around the world. And throughout these 10 years, we have discovered that, you know, with science, when facts are facts and there are no alternative facts, when you work with science, science becomes a foundation. It's not political. Here are the facts. How do we manage this, this information, make the smartest decisions and not waste resources? That's kind of what we do. It's science to solutions. Had some big wins along the way. The, the federal bill to, to ban microbeads is one of our big ones. And we're still working today, now going more upstream, working with cities. So uh, that's how Five Jars began, the kind of work we do, and, and that's us. Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. Lindsay, you want to cover your end of it? 
Your thing. So first, thanks for having us, Daniel. It's great to be here. Um, so I work with Adventure Scientists. I'm the project creation manager, which I guess to explain Adventure Scientists, what we do is we find scientists trying to answer big questions and then we deploy a network of volunteers who are outdoor adventurers and we train them to go collect data so that they can help those scientists answer questions at scale. Um, we were also celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. So happy 10 years, Marcus. Um, we were founded by Greg Trinish back in, yeah, 10 years ago. And he was at this point in his life where he'd been doing so many expeditions and kept getting so much personal gratitude from them, which I'm sure we've all experienced and wanted to start giving that back to the conservation efforts. And so he thought, you know, how can I give back while I'm out here? And it's, I can collect data. And so what my job is, is identifying those scientists that could benefit from that scaled up that data. So I spend most of my day researching and talking to scientists, just doing phenomenal work at all scales across the world. So that's adventure scientists in a nutshell. Awesome. Well, you know, I think both of your organizations do amazing jobs of really democratizing the ability to do the science and, and, you know, get people both on the ground involved in it and more importantly, you know, take on these massive scale efforts with such amazing ways of getting people empowered to be a part of it. And that's something that we're really passionate about as well. And, you know, both from the innovation angle of citizen science, as we'll dive into, and from the opportunity to be entrepreneurial about it and you know, create new initiatives, create new products and technologies that can enable us to address these major problems. And so what I'm gonna do, we're gonna dive into a couple uh, questions we have for, for us. And then from there at the end, we're gonna have a Q&A for about 15 to 20 minutes. So, uh, so definitely save your questions. And if you have them, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, but with that, I'm gonna dive into our first question. And Lindsay, we'll start with you. So how has your organization led efforts on upstream and or downstream marine plastics identification, removal and or replacement? Yeah, so um, I'll start by saying, uh, Marcus, Greg says, hi, I was supposed to tell you that. He says he misses you. Um, so uh, with that- I got that a good story to share in a minute, go ahead. What's up? I got a good story to share in a minute, but go ahead. Perfect. <laughs> So um, yeah, our involvement with microplastics, it's largely centered around a project we did that was four years long. It started in 2013, um, where we collected the largest known data set on microplastics. Uh, and with that, we had over a thousand volunteers deployed and they were collecting, they collected over 3000 samples. They were able to collect from every continent and every ocean. So we had both marine and freshwater samples collected. Um, I'll say more about some of the impacts of that project later on, but I would say that that has been um, a very influential study in this world. And so we're really proud to be part of it. Awesome. And, uh, and you know, just that I'm really excited to hear Marcus's overlap with you guys because I didn't know there was history there. So <laughs> Marcus, how about, how about you? Same question. That was a great, uh, huge data set that you guys collected, Lindsay. Uh, Really massive effort, but having that 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 ability to reach out to you know a lot of community scientists that want to participate, you know, the story I was going to tell you is that Greg and I we first met was in a bar at a conference about ten years ago. He was just starting, we had just started, and we really hit it off talking about that that balance between you know, adventure, personal adventures, and then realizing how how selfish it is when you come home from an adventure. You're all pumped up, and you're like okay, there's so much work to be done. How do you connect the two? And it was a really great meeting and we've stayed and we've stayed friends ever, ever since watching how each other's organizations have grown. Uh, so it's been, been a great collaboration to see this community really grow around this ocean plastics issue among others. Um, I mean, the question was about upstream versus downstream. Uh, no, so it was first, first just uh, as far as five gyres, how have you guys really led the effort on, on upstream and downstream? And then we'll- well, you know, um, when I think of downstream, I think of you know the middle of the ocean, the ocean being downhill from everywhere. And that's where, like I said, were the first big questions we wanted to answer was everyone, 10 years ago, we had policymakers, we had corporations, we had the public and lawmakers all saying, what is this garbage patch? And there's all this, this media sensationalism around islands of trash. So I think we, we saw an opportunity to go sail around the world, launched a bunch of expeditions, 
about 20 so far, crossing big ocean basins on a, on a ship that's uh, owned by Pangea Explorations, a great company, one of their first expeditions actually, across North Atlantic. Uh, in that first expedition, we discovered why you don't sail the North Atlantic in January. We got massive storms. We had this, what, what we call the hurricane gap, where we had 60 knot winds consistent for four days, no sampling. But other expeditions, we produced you know, thousands and thousands of ocean samples and published the first, the first paper describing the abundance of, of plastics and the weight of all sizes in all oceans. That was published back in 2015. But then again, you know, I remember I went to the, the headquarters of Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati, Ohio. And this is big towering monolith of a building and went to the very top floor, met the CEO and their sustainability director. And, and Anna and I, we both had a jar of microplastics in the middle of the oceans. And the first thing they said was, well, that's not ours. I was like, well, well, I guess we don't know. And that was the point is that when it gets in the middle of the ocean, you really don't know which company, which country. It's the ultimate tragedy of the commons. So we, would, we thought it's essential to go upstream. And when I think upstream, um, I think what's you know, above the beach, below the beach, the ocean, above the beach, everything else. But then upstream, downstream also has to do with the consumer. You know, once, once plastic leaves your hands, that's downstream. Before it gets you, that's upstream. So there are two definitions to it. So moving upstream with both definitions, we do research uh, inland. We just published a paper, I can tell you more about uh, later, about plastics in the stomachs of camels in the middle of the desert, a desert ocean, if you will. Uh, but we also do work, lots of policy work, work with the cities to understand what is the kind of trash that's on the ground in your city, where is it? What are the behaviors? What are the kinds of products uh, that are being made? Are they single use? What are the true costs of upstream and downstream? And, and that all informs sort of what we do upstream um, to, try to try to stop the flow of trash all the way to the downstream and the ocean. And I think one of the key things that underlines a lot of this is the fact that you have to make people empathetic to, to that, right? And I know the imaging obviously behind the Great Pacific Garbage Patch has been kind of one of the most effective, but you know, it's, it's I, I find almost like a greater societal challenge of you know, making people not only care, but really you know, bought into addressing the problem. And it's been great to see marine plastics kind of pick up that traction. And of course, there's so many other problems to address as well. Um, but I think the amazing thing that, that the science has to offer and the work you guys have done is really offered is this ability to really you know, tangibly show, hey, here's plastic or tree from the middle of the ocean, and what are you going to do about it? And seeing, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, this tragedy of the commons. And, you know, it's for me one of the greatest statistics that that stands out to me is is the fact that by 2050 we're on pace to have as much plastic by weight in the ocean as fish, right? And it's just, you know, the the, the solutions needed to to uh, curb that trajectory is really incredible, but. I'm really happy, you know, to hear the work you guys are doing to, to get, get towards that. And that leads into perfectly my next question, which is what role has innovation played in each of your efforts? And, you know, whether it's citizen science or materials innovation, would love to hear. Um, Marcus, you want to start back on, on this next one? Sorry, uh, just in the chat, but let's send some, uh, some references. I'm going to try and send some references to the science papers in the chat and some questions. Uh, but to answer your question now about, about innovation, mm -hmm. you know, that's really where it's at. You know, after the last, the last 10 years, we saw a need for basic information. How much plastic is out there? What are the impacts, uh, the ecological impacts, social impacts, economic impacts um, um, on land and in, the, and in the ocean? But with all that, that primary research being done, there's still a need for more but we know enough to act. What we're seeing now is not just the policies uh, come online, but a lot of innovation coming from the private sector. I mean, we, we have met so many startups that have novel solutions. Um, Ecovata, for example, is one I love. They, they make mushroom-based mycelium packaging. So instead of packaging your TV with, with polystyrene, you can fill it with, with sawdust, inoculate it, and make the same kind of packaging, 100% biodegradable. Um, we're doing a study now with a biomaterial called PHA, 
We did an interesting study a few years back, three years ago. We took a bunch of uh, PLA products. You know those corn cups you get at like eco events? It has a green leaf on it. It says made of corn, compostable. All that stuff, we saw that just taking the world by storm as folks looking for solutions. We took a bunch of those products, uh, a few paper products, paper straws, and they had one PHA beach toy, a really thick plastic beach toy made from polyhydroxyl alkanoate, PHA. We put them all in a crate, uh, a, a milk crate, a dozen bricks, and put a lid on it, and we sunk it under a fishing dock for two years. And we found, I was surprised, I pulled it out of the water, covered in oysters and worms, all this marine life, opened the box up, and all that PLA was still there, had not changed in two years, and there's 20 feet of water in the ocean here in Long Beach, California. But that PHA cup, it was gone. So I think of innovation, thinking of this, of, of some of the new materials come online. So our study now, we're gonna start next month, we're gonna take a bunch of PHA products we're going to put them in Maine in an aquatic and terrestrial environment, and then in Florida, aquatic terrestrial, and in California, aquatic terrestrial. Six environments, different temperatures, different seasons, and see how these PHA products perform. So what we're seeing for five gyres, we're not just about doing the primary science. It's also doing science and innovation, being a third party uh, validator of some of these claims uh, for, for products. So when a company like a that makes a PLA cup, so it's, it's compostable and the public thinks biodegradable, they, the public gets greenwashed because they see it doesn't go away in their compost bin. Uh, uh, cities that have composting facilities don't want PLA anymore. So it sort of sets a bad, a bad precedent. So if you have, if we can provide that third party research, I think it's gonna help these innovators get some validation of their claims. Another one real quick, and then I'll stop, is uh, plastic and asphalt. Like here in Los Angeles, we, we just, um, there's a great group called the, um, uh, the Clean Seas Coalition, uh, a bunch of NGOs come together, and we found out that in the last couple of years, the city of LA has been uh, uh, planning to do a test road, like a couple city blocks, with asphalt embedded with plastics. And the idea is plastics make the roads last longer, the roads are harder, and all these performance properties. But we found out no one's asked the question, what happens when it rains? Or over time, do those microplastic particles degrade and come out of the, of the asphalt? Another opportunity for a third party validator to then look at that innovation and say, is it really an innovation we want? So we're finding, in terms of asking a question about innovation, we find that's a space we're occupying now, being a, being a third party science organization, objectively come in and say, this works or doesn't work, and here's what we've discovered. And you know, I, I have to, there's a key thing that you just touched on that, I, that really resonates with Seaworthy, which is basically the notion of sustainability versus regeneration, right? And, and you know what PHA is doing, right, is getting plastic out of the supply chain and replacing it with something that's actually good for the environment. And you know, essentially recycling plastic at the end of the day still keeps plastic in the environment in the supply chain, right? There's there, there's it's not actually removing it necessarily from the equation. And I think that's kind of what you're you know showing is happening is where even though they're repurposing it, it still may have these harmful, harmful effects. And so you know, it's how do we actually solve the problem, right? How do we actually remove plastic from the environment altogether and not just, you know, really greenwash, as you mentioned, um, and greenwash the problem. And uh, it's just such a such a key thing that I think as consumers, right, we're all like, well, they recycled plastics. This is great. I want to support it. And trust me, I'm a sucker for like the Adidas Parlay stuff. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, at the end of the day, you know, still, if you wash those clothes, that's still creating these polyester fibers that are getting in into the into the water. So it's, it's an interesting conundrum where, you know, they are doing a step in the right direction, but is it actually solving the problem, right? And it's just, I, I, I love to like really get to the root cause stuff. Anyway, sorry, Lindsay, didn't mean to get too much on a tangent there, but I did have the same question for you as far as what role innovation has played in your work uh, with, with adventure scientists. Yeah, so um, I think, Innovation is really just embedded in our entire model. If you think about what we're doing as an org, um, we haven't found anyone else doing anything quite like it. Um, 
we're able to, you know, often you, you think of community science and it's driven by this desire to connect the community members to the science. Our role is to help the scientists and use the community members to do that. And so we have like a slightly tweaked shift in there. And so I think that's really innovative because Often what we find is you talk to a scientist and say, yeah, we do community science. And they kind of turn their nose up at it often and think that it's not gonna be high quality data. It's gonna be like a, a learning opportunity and like that's the end of it. What we've done is we've found ways to like collect data that is really moving the needle forward. And we're able to get scientists access to very high quality data that previously just like you, you could not get it. Um, for example, we've had folks collect uh, fungus samples from Mount Everest that has really done amazing work for um, agriculture. And we've had deep sea divers collecting for this microplastic. So we're really able to just expand and work at this amazing scale. Um, you know, there are, I, don't, I couldn't even guess, hundreds of thousands of folks out on public lands, out playing in nature every day. And to be able to find a way to take those people and actually turn that adventure into something that's giving back to the bigger picture, I think that's really important. Um, as far as microplastics and marine work goes, we, we've done the microplastic study and we've continued to have um, impact in that field from that. And I'll say a little bit more later about a coral study that we're launching soon. Um, because we work at all scales, I will say that, <clears throat> excuse me, much, much of our impact and where we've been able to see this like innovation really come to life has been in a more terrestrial sense. That's not to say we're not also having our impact on the marine and it's been fun being part of that. Um, but yeah, we've done a really great job at like getting to the heart of a project or an issue area for timber. Like timber is an example. We are collecting timber samples across species ranges to build genetic reference libraries to stop illegal timber harvest. And so it's really thinking strategically about how to see a problem and go about finding that solution and supporting the scientists. So yeah. Great, cool. and, and that's a perfect lead into my next question for you, Lindsay, which is what are some of the broader applications of your organization's plastic work for measuring anthropogenic impact on the oceans? Yeah, so uh, the, the data set that we've we've got, we've had it requested hundreds of times. So we very much so believe in open data and we share it free to anyone who wants it. I can drop a link if someone's interested in seeing that. Um, we've had Government agencies ask for it. We've asked, we've had like schools ask for it. So it's really great to see it applied to policy as well as education. Um, it is our most commonly requested data set, which is really exciting to like get to share that with everyone. Um, and I would say there, there have been like numerous studies that have come out of this work. And I can drop another link to some of those studies as well. Um, yeah, did I answer your question or was there more to it? Yeah, well, I was gonna say if you wanted to expand on the on the on the coral survey work that you had as well. I'm saving that one for a later question. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Tricky. All right. <laughs> um, well, in that case, I'm gonna throw uh, the next question to Marcus. And that is, what role do you see startups or new ventures playing in addressing the global marine plastic problem? I know we touched a little bit on this earlier. Um you know, I, I think it, it, it's essential to have a, a space for innovation, at least to, to test the waters, to get in there and, and sh show a new product. And I can't tell you how many times that we, we get um, innovators come to us and say, well, we sponsor there or look at their product or promote their product. Um, you know, you, you have to have that, that space. Otherwise, the status quo just dominates. And in many cases, the status quo does. You know, big corporations that have made a killing off of off of plastics, petrochemical companies there, they're powerful. They're, they're valued in the, in, in the hundreds of billions of dollars collectively. So they also can wield that power to make sure things don't change much and to, and to deflect any kind of regulation. But what's hard for them to control is when uh, an innovator comes in with a really disruptive new idea and, 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 that, takes, and, and that takes a foothold. Um, PHA I think is an example of of one of those, uh, but we've seen lots of uh, reuse models that begin to get a foothold as well. Um, there's one company called Vessel that they come into a community and any, any restaurant coffee shop will, will then use their cup 
and you can bring a dirty cup to any restaurant, any coffee shop, they clean it, go back to the next customer. So it's a way to have a reuse economy rather than having the thing just throw away. There's a company called Repack, has a reusable mailer. And I'm watching them closely because they could innovate the way Amazon, FedEx, and UPS ship things with a mailer that, that can be reused, you know, a hundred times or more. So I think you, you need these um, innovators to come in. Now, not all are gonna succeed. And I would guess that most of them do not. Uh, but the ones that do, the ones that have the greatest potential to disrupt are the ones that can, can really pivot the way industry moves. They're, they're the biggest threat to industry. Um, but yet you have to have them in, in the space. And we, we support all of them. If they need testing materials, that's where we, we can come in today. And I wanted to ask one more thing I wanted to say, um, uh, Lindsay, so Abby Barrows, one of the lead authors on one of your papers, that big data set, uh, is actually working with us on this PHA study, uh, helping us to, uh, to do our sample analysis in Maine where she lives. She's a great That's scientist. Amazing. Yeah, I haven't had the chance to meet her, but I've heard about her so much. So it's really great. Yeah. It's a close community. All the, all the, all the scientists on plastics know each other pretty well. It is really a small world on the, <laughs> in just the ocean space and the plastics. I love, I love hearing that. And, you know, sometimes we bring people together and they've, you know, like you guys had old connections or, you know, things they didn't even know they were working on together. So that's really, really cool to hear. Um, so Lindsay, same question for you. Uh, what role do you see these startups and new ventures playing in addressing the global marine plastic problem? You know, I don't think I can give quite as detailed of an answer as Marcus can, but I will say that one thing I see a very serious need for is getting more community members engaged in those startups, in those new ideas, find ways to bring the community to the water. The more that we can engage um, folks on, like in the water and on the land, the more they're actually going to be bought into fixing the problem. We've done surveys of our volunteers and you know, you ask about if they have a better understanding of the problem, are they more likely to advocate for this issue? And it's amazing what a day out in the field collecting data can do to connect someone to a problem. And so, you know, I don't think I'm as well versed in all the individual efforts that are going on, but I can say the more that the just community is brought in, the better it's gonna be. Those, those are gonna be the solutions that last. Absolutely. And, and, and just building that community, right? Getting people, you know, whether you're a science background or not, right? You, you, it's, it's all inclusive. And the idea is that we just need to get people to actually have their hands-on experience to understand, like, you can make an impact in this, regardless of whether your background's in humanities or business. If you have the passion for it, you know, at the end of the day, you just have to get on the ground and start doing it. That's the only way you're ever going to start to get your feet wet and, and really do it. And so, you know, for me, with Seaworthy, we're very much about this inclusive mindset and trying to bring people in. That's why we have events like this. And it's really cool to see, you know, with you guys as well, that's just such a critical piece of the puzzle that I think a lot of people may not realize is such an opportunity and that they you know, don't have to accept these metaphorical barriers to, to actually getting into the field. Hey, Danny, uh, but, if I can add something about yeah. startups. Now, I, I, was, I was thinking just now as uh, Lindsay was talking, and just think about their, the role of startups, that there's also a risk. You know, I'm, I'm thinking back to, to moments where there have been some startups. I can't tell you how many times I've had uh, innovators come to us, small startups, and say, we have a new idea how to clean up the ocean. And I'm like, okay, not again. I had one great one recently was a giant floating pizza-shaped platform, 100 meters in diameter. Each slice in the middle of the ocean floating would capture trash. Then the ship would go empty those little slices. And it was so well thought out, it was, it was amazing. But of course, we, we take issue with that downstream, focusing on the cleanup rather than prevention. Most big issues in the world, like the, ozone, the whole the ozone layer to smog over cities, solved by preventative policy. So some of those innovators come in with a great idea and they're so excited about it. And, and sometimes we have to say, well, have you thought of this and thought of these questions? So I would, I would urge innovators to not hesitate to reach out to scientists, even ones that they think might not agree with them because they might get information that can help them to more refine and, and better use their, their resources and sort of tweak their minds in the, in the direction that is likely going to be a solution rather than perpetuate a problem. Um, and the other, other thing I wanted to mention about innovators 
it's not just innovators of things, of products, it's innovators working in this, in this space and other roles. One great example that in the last few years I've, I've got to know is a, a company called Soul Buffalo. And Soul Buffalo for many years was just running expeditions around climate change. They were taking scientists and, uh, and, and, and big uh, corporate leaders out to the Arctic or Antarctica to see for themselves the impacts. They, they then leveraged, they, they, they pivoted to plastics. And we joined them about two and a half years ago, the Ocean Plastic Leadership Summit. And we had like 120 executives, scientists, green pieces on board, World Wildlife Fund, all looking at ocean plastics uh, uh, directly. And right now, interesting about, about this company, Soul Buffalo, they're not selling a thing. They're creating a platform for ideas. They are in the next year, they have four uh, virtual conferences, all discussing a proposed UN treaty on plastic pollution. A UN treaty that's been proposed by World Wildlife Fund, um, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and 30 big brands. So that's the big 2021 conversation I see as around what does a global strategy look like? And yet this innovative small company, Soul Buffalo, taking a huge leadership role, not selling a thing but creating this useful platform. So innovation can serve in, in many different aspects. Absolutely. <laughs> so much there. Um, that really, really appreciate all that info. And I, I hope you guys are taking notes because I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, and that's a perfect lead into the last question I have for you guys before we get to our Q&A, uh, which is what advice do you have for people looking to get involved in marine plastics work or ocean science in general and may not even have a scientific background? Uh, Lindsay, I'm going to throw it back to you for, for this one. Yeah, so the moment you've been waiting for, the Coral Project. Um, so we're launching this project uh, along the west coast of Mexico um, with uh, Dr. Paula Rodriguez from the University of Guadalajara. And this is just one specific example of a way to get engaged. With this project, we are um, going to be doing habitat surveys and uh, surveying coral health. Um, in, I think there's 40 different sites along that coast and we're having deep sea divers do it. It hasn't launched yet, so we haven't started recruiting, but if you are a diver and you like going to Mexico and you love the ocean, we've got a project for you. Um, and so what the outcome from this project is, is that we're hoping it will, what the goal is, is that it will lead to um, new designations for protected sites. Um, it'll inform shipping routes uh, and just in general help guide tourist management. So that's, that's one very specific example of something coming down our pipeline. In general, like I said, there are so many community science efforts out there. I guarantee there is something, if you, if you live near the coast, I guarantee there is something near you. So just looking into what those local um, organizations are doing, uh, it doesn't have to be global scale or across the entire uh, uh, country to be impactful. So, you know, check, just Google community science, citizen science, volunteer science, see where you can engage in your communities. Um, and I do want to add, Daniel, you mentioned about inclusivity in work, and I just want to say that's something that at Adventure Scientists we're really working on trying to find more equitable ways to approach our projects. We know that not everybody has access to uh, diving gear and all the money and time that goes into becoming a certified diver, so um, I really appreciate you bringing up that there are barriers that exist and like it's important to like work to overcome those barriers and create opportunities for everyone. So that's something that we're trying to do in all of our projects from moving forward. We are hoping to create more inclusivity with them. Awesome. And yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that you bring up the, the diver portion. Like I don't even think about that because diving itself is obviously, you know, the cost barrier alone is, is huge and took me, took a lot of my friends years to, you know, save up and, and actually take it on as a hobby. But, you know, just to make that, you know, gear rentals accessible and, you know, keep people actually, you know, able to keep up their diving and, and practice to do impactful work is such a, a key opportunity. So I, I love hearing that, Lindsay. Um, and last time, at least, Marcus, uh, same question for you. What advice do you have for people looking to get involved in marine plastics work or ocean science in general? I think Lindsay answered it really well. Uh, I, would, I would just add, you know, I frequently get asked, what can, what can you do? What can the individual do? And I often divert the question to, to, to say it's, 
it's less about what you can do to change a problem that's in the ocean, but what you as an organized group can do. So getting organized and finding those volunteer efforts that Lindsay talked about are essential. Um, and I have not been to a town yet that doesn't have a group of people that are passionate about the ocean. Um, even inland, uh, the Inland Ocean Coalition I've, I've been working with lately, they have, I think, 10 or more chapters across the country. And they're all deep inland in Kansas, in Denver, in Missouri, um, uh, with their, their chapters, really oceans focused. So I think for anyone can get involved in some capacity getting organized in a group. A great example I'll share with you is our microbead campaign. We published a paper back in 2013 on plastic microbeads in the Great Lakes. And what came from that, two years later, President Obama signed the Microbead Free Waters Act. But during those two years, it was a lot of people getting organized. We had filmmakers who were making little mini documentaries. We had um, a Tulane Law School dedicated one quarterly journal to a sample microbead federal bill. We had uh, over 50 organizations sharing media resources, communication, uh, 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 press releases, and so forth. Um, it was an amazing collaboration. So those, those people getting organized and then organizations getting organized. And that just had tremendous momentum, tremendous power. Put that bill in front of Obama and it became, it became law. The same can happen for, for any other issues that are uh, um, uh, harming our oceans today. So I would, I would just say, find your, your niche, your skill, get organized and, and move forward. And, and I love that key, and, and I'm gonna, gonna have to bring it back to the seaworthy side for a sec, but just the, the key piece about it not being this individualistic effort, right? And actually creating, pun intended, collective effort, right? Like bringing people together, stakeholders together as well to, to actually you know get people involved here in Miami, you know, we're, I, I believe, actually, sorry, in, in San Diego, where I was previously, I know Surfrider led the charge on doing a styrofoam ban and, you know, engaging, uh, you know, politicians and, and local government to try to actually, you know, take beach uh, cleanup data and turn that into actionable policy decisions, which happened. So you now just there, there's so many great different organizations that offer those opportunities. I saw Anna put a uh, surf rider in the chat there, which reminded me. So, um, so yeah, it, we're, you know, it's just such a, a key piece about this is, is, you know, especially because I feel like there's also this consumer shaming thing, right. Where, you know, people say, well, you're using plastic ba bags at the grocery store. Right. But at the end of the day, this is such a bigger problem than an individual decision-making. Although of course, every individual decision matters. So, um, the great points, you know, first off, before we get to Q and A, I just want to say thank you, Marcus and Lindsay, you guys both had amazing points and we're again, really happy to have you guys here to kick off the year with us. I'm going to turn it over the Q and A. And the first question I saw was from John Klein. John, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure thing. Um, hello everyone. Thanks so much, Marcus and Lindsay for being here and answering all these questions. It's been really interesting to hear from you guys. Um, the question I had was in regards to earlier, you were talking about Marcus, these kind of cool bioplastic alternatives that are starting to emerge. And I'm just curious about what are the major barriers to scaling those options so that they can be more widespread um, for use and start replacing our traditional plastics? That's a really good question. And we actually had a call yesterday talking about that. How does, how, how does PHA scale? Right now, the few companies who are making it, there are a few, there's Mango Materials Full Cycle, there's New Light Technologies, Danimer Scientific is a big one. They can't make enough. They, they can't make enough to fill the orders. But even, even, even with their combined capacity, it's nowhere near the current capacity of, of polyethylene, polypropylene, traditional fossil fuel-based plastics. So you've got with those tr traditional plastics, 75 years of research and development and tremendous infrastructure build out. So they dominate the market. So how does PHA get market share? It, it needs to, um, um, for example, what we're doing with our study is providing a third party uh, validation that it does work, it does degrade the environment. Because there is, there is a consumer and, and companies that might wanna use PHA, they're a little bit hesitant to use it because in the greenwash on PLA. They think, why would we spend so much money using PHA when maybe it's not really biodegradable, maybe it's compostable, the consumers are confused. We with our study want to just provide information. So one is 
uh, scale by, by being able to make enough to meet demand. The other is building market confidence. And, and the third thing is you're competing with this, this massive behemoth of an industry that's well established that has hundreds of lawyers on, the, on their staff and a, and a marketing team, advertising team, and the ability to buy and gobble up these smaller companies if they're too competitive. So right now, I think it's, a, it's, it's quite the wild west. I, I know Danimer Scientific just went public, I think a $930 million valuation. So there is, there is lots of confidence there that these companies will get a share of the market. Right now, it's an uphill battle. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Awesome. Uh, next, Anna, you had a question? Go ahead and unmute. Uh, sure. So I was wondering what opportunities there are in the South Florida or Miami area um, to get involved in, in the community doing citizen science work or community work. I don't know what the preferred term is. But yeah. Lindsay, you might no, I want to, I, I know, I know it's not local you, but <laughs> Yeah, so at the moment, we don't have any projects that are in that area. Um, we have a wild and scenic rivers project. So if there are wild and scenic rivers in that area, then that would be an option. I, I personally use community scientist and community science. I don't know if that's universally what folks are saying at this point or not. So I don't have an answer on that, but I would I don't know specifically in that area, um, but I would say our Wild and Scenic Rivers project would be my best guess at the moment. And I know someone had linked uh, Debris Free Oceans. They're, they're a local, also plastic uh, nonprofit. Uh, yep, there you go, Whitney. Whitney got it as well. Surfrider um, in South Florida also. Yeah, absolutely. I've worked with them in the past in, in Miami. Yeah, no, they're, we're, we're in, in touch with them as well. Yeah, they're, they're both doing great stuff. Um, and I think some people posted the links in there as well, or if, if you guys can. Um, anyway, uh, next question we have is from Whitney. Whitney, would you like to unmute? Sure, so I am the vice chair of Surfrider Florida Keys. And so we, um, right now in Florida, there's a lot of bans local municipalities from allowing um, them to ban styrofoam, plastics, things like that. And then, so right now there's a proposed bill to overturn that. And we, um, Surfrider Florida Keys and Surfrider Miami are gonna be speaking to some state legislature and um, representatives in the coming weeks. So I'm wondering um, from either of you, if you have you know, some good advice of how to best hone in um, ourselves for um, lifting that ban and just any advice you have for creating policy change. That's the preemption bill you're talking about in Florida? Yeah. The bans, the ban on bans? Yes. Um, I wish I had an answer. I mean, I, I applaud you guys for taking it on. I think that's the petrochemical company's uh, uh, strategy because they saw it here in California where I live, you had a hundred cities that banned plastic bags and then Governor Brown said, okay, the state wants this, the state will ban it. And I think that's where industry saw the grassroots, uh, the grassroots effort was the major threat because from the grassroots, the popularity led to state bans and then potentially a federal ban. Um, I'm trying to think how that's been addressed. I, I think I saw other organizations addressing the preemption bill in other states by, by framing it as the, the rights of municipalities to manage their own finances because it's not the state, but cities that have to pay to clean up, you know, plastic waste on roadsides within their municipalities. They have to pay to pull plastic bags out of trees, out of storm drains, and they have to pay for municipal waste management services and local landfills. All those costs, cities are attempting to mitigate those costs by banning products that are most pervasive as waste. So I've seen it framed as, as cities should have the right to be able to mitigate the biggest costs to their waste management uh, uh, systems. So maybe I might just want to look into to follow up on uh, a strategy like that. Yeah, that's great. That's Thank you. And that's not even touching on the fact that I know there's been a lot of reporting coming out about the efficacy of, of recycling as well. 
just a just a note there. But um, yeah, we have time for one or two more questions if anyone still had them to put in the chat. Um, otherwise, I do have one more bonus question prepared. If not, um, or, or Whitney, sorry, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Didn't mean to cut you off. No. Okay. So in that case, uh, Marcus, uh, I have one more question for you, which is just what changes in policy funding or the overall infrastructure for facilitating solutions do you see helping facilitate further progress in addressing marine plastics in the near future? It's a huge question. You need a whole hour for that one. Yeah, <laughs> best for last. My first thought is when, when, I, when I talk about this, this issue, I think if the first break it down, break down the complexity of what we mean by plastics, ocean plastics. Um, and and I, I made a little pie chart. It has 10, 10 slices for all the different sectors. I mean, plastics in textiles are very different from plastic pellets, from plastics used in, in tires, plastic and single use plastics and fishing gear, durable goods, electronics. They're all different plastics, different polymers, uh, different ways they're used. Uh, different economic, social, ecological impacts, different ways that they enter the environment. Um, so with all those differences, you kind of have to take off, take one slice and focus on that. When I take that pie chart and I then say, okay, where is the demonstrated harm? Where have scientists said, here's where harm is happening? It's in two sectors, fishing gear and single-use plastics. So I think about policies, if you want impact, impact comes from mitigating harm from addressing risk. So I see two, two areas that where there's need for, for, for policy. And you see this happening already in the whole fishing industry with fishing gear and then single-use plastics. And this effort for a global UN strategy, I'll touch on that real quick. In the last, I'd say last eight months, we've seen three documents, one from Ellen MacArthur Foundation, World Wildlife Fund, and 30 brands that call for UN strategy. Then you had CL in Gaia, who put out a document calling for a global strategy. And then the council, the Nordic Council of Ministers, three three months ago, no, another uh, call for a global strategy. <clears throat> so this is the 2021 conversation right now. Is about what is a global strategy look like? And then February 22, uh, UNEA five is going to debate what a UN resolution might look like. The important effort, I think, now. Is to, is to look at fishing gear, single-use plastics in the context of a global strategy, and then, and then think about um, what are the different stakeholder perspectives. Industry is gonna focus on downstream, on cleanup, more cleanup, and, 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 and reject any regulation. But, but we have to make sure that we're keeping it as preventative as possible. Getting rid of single-use plastics, monitoring the way fishing gear is used, so that's where I see the future of policy happening right now, these big picture, big picture debates. Yeah, well, sorry, sorry, I threw the, the curveball at the end there, but you handled it beautifully. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was There's a lot happening this year on this issue. So that could yeah. be a whole other conversation we have. Yeah, let's, let's just plan, plan another panel while we're at it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. That, that was great. And I think we have one more question. Perfect, because that's all we have, we have time for. Uh, Bobby, you want to unmute and ask your question? Hi, thanks, Sandra. This has been so interesting. I love the emphasis on upstream. Um, what have you come across the plastic bank, and 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 or is that something you're working with? Uh, that's uh, Dave Katz, right? Yeah, uh, Dave Katz, the founder of Plastic Bank. It's an interesting concept. I mean, it it, it works in countries where you can have have uh, corporate contributions that then subsidize a recovery. Of, of plastic items. Um, it's not policy driven. I wouldn't say it's long lasting. And, and the corporations, they, they feed into it as long as there's a positive return for them. I mean, maybe it's their uh, align with their ESG goals or, or, or they get some good PR out of the, the process. Um, I think Plastic Bank is, is good to get the, the awareness started, but you've got to come in with, with policies that create a long-term solution. And I don't think Plastic Bank does that. But they are great to go into a community with corporate support to get the conversation going. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I want to first off, 
again, thank Marcus and Lindsay for your time today. This has been a wonderful way to start the year and I've learned so much. I've been trying to keep up with all the information. My head's about to explode, um, but really, really, you know, just a wonderful dive into really what the, the state of you know, plastics are for the future and, and all the different ways that we can do uh, get to do something about it. You know, I, I know we've been, you guys have been posting links to your reports and resources. If there's anything else, that you guys want to share, please make sure to share that in the chat. We want to make sure everybody here has a way of following you guys and, and keeping up with uh, the work that you guys are doing because it's so critical and we really appreciate it. So thank you again. Uh, I'm going to do a quick screen share just to just to wrap up here. Um, and again, if you guys have any other questions, um, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to follow up and and you know let let people answer them on their own time. Um, I'm just going to quickly just again say thank you. Um, <laughs> and then if my PowerPoint works, there we go. Um, and so this just really highlights, again, the opportunity to do something about it. And we really want to highlight our opportunities for sea change, which we've launched for this year as our way of giving you guys the chance to really pursue doing uh, co-founding a startup to help address the problems that we've highlighted today. And, um, and so definitely check out our website. Julie is actually putting all the links in the chat. And additionally, um, all of our social media and, and information is there as well. And then this is just our kind of overview of what we're working on this year, as far as, you know, again, having bringing our community together for these events, uh, bringing together sponsors and partners and mentors and collaborators, which is leading into this venture studio that we're launching this spring. And at the same time, finding existing startups also out there to bring together for this collective innovation pipeline that will be developing throughout the year and leading into our incubator and accelerator. So um, if you have any questions, we'll be sticking around for a couple minutes. Uh, I just want to say thank you all again for coming today. Thank you again, Marcus and Lindsay. This has been wonderful. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be having some more exciting events coming up next month and looking forward to working with you all some more in the future. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsy. Thank yeah, you, thank you. It was great to learn more about your work. Yeah, like my brain hurt. <laughs> it was awesome. Awesome yeah. work, guys.